Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Nuggets News. Today we've got a special guest and that's Kyle who's one of the founders of uh, Fulcrum and BZX. You've probably read in the news this week their platform did undergo an exploit that was taken advantage of twice this week. So I'm going to walk you through exactly what happened, what this means for DeFi, how we resolve this. We're going to talk about Chainlink and Oracles. So I know it must be a stressful week, so thanks so much for joining us, Kyle. Yeah, thanks for having me, Alex. Maybe let's start by walking people through... um, what happened from a really beginner's level because the flash loans is one of the newer parts of DeFi where we're able to borrow money up front and that's one of the main issues that led to this happening, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So flash loans really reduce the barrier to uh, take advantage of an exploit and it also makes it much, much more likely that the exploit will get executed because normally to get that amount of money on chain, you have to go through KYC somewhere. You'll have a trail uh, you'll pollute your money. It's not a winning bet. Uh, so, yeah, flash loans let you do this tornado cash, be anonymous, make a bunch of money, maybe cash it out, maybe not. It's all upside. Yeah, so some people are calling this a hack on social media and whatnot, but really a lot of things actually executed the way that they were meant to. And what really happened was someone created an arbitrage opportunity. And as you say, to make arbitrage worthwhile, you need a lot of money. So most people don't have a million dollars laying around, for example, but the flash loans um, enable this to happen. So do, should we walk people through what happened from that first step? I believe someone borrowed uh, 11,000 Ethereum on DYDX platform. Um, do you want to maybe take it through there, slowly beginners level stuff about what happened from there? Yeah, yeah. So they went ahead and uh, put about half their ETH on Compound, used it to uh, borrow WBTC, put about half their ETH on Fulcrum, um, and then they entered into um, a very large trade using our ETH WBTC 5X leverage token, which we hadn't actually released yet. We were kind of like it wasn't even in the UI. Uh, This person had really been uh, playing around with some of our more esoteric tokens. Yes. Um, And... So they, they, this large trade through Uniswap, um, usually we have a block of code that says if you, if you trade and then you're below margin maintenance, then revert. But for some reason, this didn't activate and a flag was put up um, telling the system that this was an over collateralized loan, no trading had happened, and so just go on ahead. And so when they were able to create slippage using other people's money that they didn't have to pay for, they were able to harvest that. So like it, all of their profit comes from trading with other people's money mm-hmm. and then just taking that slippage on Uniswap. Um, so, but our system didn't have a bad price. It just did a normal trade, but the trade was just bigger than we usually allow. Um, Again, so for people at home, we've got the Ethereum, half of that they swapped for wrapped Bitcoin, which is just Bitcoin in the ERC20 version so it can interact with all these Ethereum smart contracts in the DeFi world. Uh, And then another large amount they entered into the token sets, which we covered on the channel last week. We have these tokens that are like a mini hedge fund or a mini trade, and they were a a five times leverage short position on the Ethereum Bitcoin pair. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Okay, cool. And from there, once they caused that slippage, you're saying that that normally shouldn't have happened. Right, right. So like usually a trade that large would cause an amount of slippage that we just revert the contract for. But there was an unusual uh, bug where this check didn't fire. It was bypassed. And basically the system did not work as designed, unfortunately. I I would say, you know, I would say I would say it's an attack, um, not quite an arbitrage opportunity since uh, they traded with other people's money. And we specifically have a block of code in there to make sure they don't do that. Um, So what happens now that they've created that large amount of slippage? Does that mean the price BTC on compound and they run it through the other side of the reserve and they make more money uh, because they're they traded with other they the losses came from other people's money and they were able to harvest that okay so the price is artificially lower than what it is because of the slippage and then they enter at that artificially low price they get more ethereum than is the true reflection of the current um eth bitcoin pair or ratio price and that's where they came out with more ethereum than they should have um that's the arbitrage for people at home that's all correct 
Yeah, so if they had just done it regularly without our platform, using their own money, and they slammed Uniswap down, and they came through Compound, and they arbed it back up, they'd actually have less money than they started with. So, you know, the, the, the secret ingredients was other people's money. Okay, the flash loans. So you say in the pre-interview it's kind of changed your uh, thoughts about flash loans or it's made people a little bit wary about it. Do you think that this is something where if that flag had have triggered and fired, this wouldn't have happened? Do you think this is something that we can prevent in future or, or what needs to change to ensure this doesn't happen again? Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of the times when we devi devi devise systems, we didn't make the assumption that attackers will have infinite amounts of capital uh, that they're willing to risk. Um, and we have to revisit that assumption. And like, frankly, you know, this assumption shouldn't really exist, but it's easy to slip into, okay, what is likely, what is plausible, what is at the far reaches of, okay, you know, this is, this is what's probably possible. Mm -hmm. um, and these flash loans make this whole, like they, they create, they increase the chance that any little exploit will get exploited by probably orders of magnitude. So the, you know, you might've been able to be, you know, fine at a cer certain security level before, but now it's completely game, game over on that. And you need to really, really lock down and you have to think of everything. And when you have like a protocol like ours that has such a attack surface, that really makes it more, like, even if you're somebody who's really good, has a deep understanding, there's just so much to check. Um, and, you know, after evaluating Kyber in light of thinking of infinite capital, we realize that somebody could come and they could just knock out every reserve until it stopped responding and then just walk up to the Uniswap reserve, which would likely be like the reserve of last resort, and then start manipulating it. So it's Kyber is, is not something that we can safely use in that manner. And, you know, and in fairness to the Kyber team, you know, th that that was not really their intention. Um, and their, once they started... Uh, Are you able once to they, close down Telegram for us, mate? The tele Sorry, the, I, I thought that was closed. Hold on a second. Yeah, those notifications are still coming through. That that's all right. Yeah, 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 I got, I got it now. Cool. Yeah. So you know, in their in their pivot, they did not intend for the for their rates to be used as price feeds, and it really just is insufficient. If a cap if a attacker has enough capital, they can really do whatever they want to you as well. Yeah, um, and I know there's been a lot of talk about Chainlink, um, but we've sort of mentioned this already. It wasn't really the price feeds and the oracles uh, that were the problem. So is this just something that's, um, I guess, a bit of a, um, a coincidence that you guys want to work more with them now, or do you think this will help um, prevent some of those other attack services going forward? Yeah, I think using Chainlink as an oracle is going to be a really big step up in our security and uh, how people think about our security. We definitely got feedback from people that, you know, the use of Kyber for like as the sole liquidity source and price feed made them nervous. They felt like it wasn't liquid enough, like it could be somehow manipulated. And the thing is, you know, we consulted with some real security professionals. Matthew DeFerrante at ZK Labs, we had our audit with him. He never told us, hey, by the way, um, everything on your protocol can be owned via Kyber. Um, you know, we we had, uh, you know, Sam ZZ Sun, we worked with him. He, he did actually eventually realize, and this was, you know, a few days ago, he came out with this proof, uh, this, you know, he, he wrote a script showing that you, you can basically take anything from Kyber. Um, just with enough capital. Um, and so, yeah, um, it, it turns out that, you know, we consulted with security professionals and, you know, I think thinking evolves and as the space evolves, you know, when, when we, when, you know, we were first audited by Matthew, flash loans weren't a thing. Kyber had like barely even launched uh, and like was probably not as well understood as it was today. Um, so like, I don't even think like Uniswap didn't exist. So, you know, the threat model didn't involve, you know, Uniswap reserve manipulation through Kyber mm -hmm. and whatnot. So it, it, things are moving so quickly that, you know, the, the threats and your threat models, uh, need to be very rapidly evolving. And that's why I think that's why having regular audits is probably 
completely critical to making sure that your protocol keeps up with the innovation in the space. Yeah, Ethereum always has taken that um, move fast and break things approach. Have you spoken to Kyber and Uniswap in the past uh, few days and um, what's come of those conversations? Oh yeah, we've talked to Kyber tons. I mean, we're, we're Kyber's number one biggest integrator. Like most most days before this, we had been you know doing more volume than Kyber Swap's own interface. So uh, we talked to them, um, and you know they said it. They're like, hey, you know, we're just not really meant to be used as a price feed. And we're like, you know, the the thing is, we we started out when their white paper said it was, and I don't think all the properties of DeFi price feeds and all the attack vectors were fully appreciated. And it got very deep into our code. Chainlink wasn't around when we when we launched. We launched before them. So you know, we're we're a product of our time and an evolving space. And a lot of a lot of the players either went the centralized route or you know they pivoted into something that you know is viable now but like wouldn't have even been something we thought was possible back in 2017 yeah. we didn't even have lego blocks to play with yeah absolutely um the other aspect of this is obviously the nexus mutual insurance payout so i know there's a uh, open protocol as well i'm not sure if that's related to this but i know the nexus mutual does have some uh pending claims and i, I do speak to hugh and those guys there and they're saying that this is one that they're waiting for the dust to settle to see how it goes but yeah what are your thoughts around um, the insurance side of things here so i do think it's a hack um and therefore, it should be considered one. However, I think they should reject the claim uh, because there are not any users that have lost money. Um, I don't think anybody can really make a, a valid claim yet. Um, you know, we, we had the problem happen. And then, you know, right when we released, it shot way back up. So, like, you know, when we turn it back on, uh, the incent incentives drive people, you know. So we have... a basically our ETH pool pays a lot of interest mm. and that's just going to incentivize liquidity. The amount of liquidity you get in a pool is proportional to the interest you pay the incentive. That's, that's all it is. And our incentive is like more, even more uh, than most. So like there's actually uh, like right the right after the hack, our pool had some of the most free liquidity um, kind of like as a ratio um, compared to almost everyone. So I, I would say that, um, yeah, I would say that there's no real risk lending there because you're, you, the problem is when a loan settles, one of two things can happen. One is you socialize the loss. So the losses haven't been socialized yet. Everybody is still maintaining their same amount of ETH. Uh, the second thing you can do is it defaults, you liquidate everything, and then you know, whoever leaves last is left holding the bag, right? So these are the two options. But, you know, we haven't gone with either of these options. What, what we have gone with is we're letting this loan stay here and service the interest to the pool. So it, it, it actually is not behaving any differently from a normal loan right now from the perspective of lenders. So like, you know, the die pool has some utilization to it. Not everybody can leave the die pool at the same time. Uh, the ETH pool has some utilization. Not everybody can leave the ETH pool at the same time. Uh, you know, if you are on compound and every lender wanted to leave at the same time, but you had one borrower who just wanted to keep the loan and but they kept servicing the loan forever, you would never get your money back. You'd be stuck. So it's the same concept here. We have a borrower who wants to just keep paying. And that's fine. Honestly, this is the best kind of customer. So you said that no one has lost any money yet. So the platform is the one that is taking the loss here. Is that correct? Or... Yeah, yeah. So exactly. So we have an insurance fund. If there's ever a time that um, the lot, there would be losses to lenders, the insurance fund absorbs it. Now, the insurance fund is not very large right now. It's about $6,000. However, we have some token economic improvements that we think uh, by our economic modeling will increase the rate of growth probably more than an order of magnitude. So um, our insurance fund can really, like based on the volumes we've been doing, even if we don't grow, our, our insurance fund can cover this uh, pretty easily uh, within maybe the course of a year, year and a half. So 
it's possible that, you know, at some point the loan settles against the insurance fund. But there's no reason not to just let this loan settle way off in the future because we're getting a great interest rate on it. Right now, the interest rate on it, you know, for supplying um, in the market in general is like 0.02 to 0.05 percent. So we're, we're able to pay the interest on this loan by our calculations by over 200 years. So uh, if you have if you're going to realize a loss over 200 years in the future, first of all, you probably don't even count that as a loss, you're not even going to be alive. So if you discount the future value of it, it, it's like zero and you're actually even getting a whole bunch of interest. So you're actually doing pretty well. So what uh, what are the steps that have been taken to stop this happening again, you know, tomorrow or, or the next day? Are we stopping those flash loans? Well, you can't stop flash loans. Like DYDX does it, Ave does it, we have them. They're got, people can make little adapters to MakerDAO to make it do flash loans. It's unstoppable. Even if we tried to coordinate, I don't think we could pull it off because there's this CDP loophole. Hmm. Um, so uh, the things that we're doing first, uh, of course, after we went and we hardened uh, the, um, the check to make sure it actually fires all the time, we implemented um, a cap on position sizes. And, um, you know, we started looking into, uh, we also like did that internally in the Oracle. So we did it both in the P tokens um, and the Oracle. So, you know, and then the last thing we wanted to do was add Chainlink. Now, you know, we are very hard at work uh, on that integration right now. We're like working day and night to try to just knock this out in days. Um, you know, we're talking to security auditors to get an emergency expedited security audit um, on all the code that we commit. And, and I think, I think for us, um, you know, the fact that we got owned two times, we can't just pin on, you know, the evolving security models and all of that. Um, you know, we need to be, we need to do better. Uh, we just need to do better. We need to have, uh, like, I don't believe that bugs are a result of people. I believe, I believe that bugs are a result of process. And so we really need to revisit our internal processes and we need to start being transparent about it. There needs to be like official uh, public code review. Uh, everything, every line of code as it's added should be you know reviewed by auditors. There should be code freezes. There should be a very um, like public, um, highly transparent process around this so everybody knows when the admin key is being used, what stage the code is at, where it's at in the process. It should all be clearly documented and laid out. And I believe that if we turn around and we say, hey, mea culpa, we, we didn't do something right and we need to radically change and we need to turn over a new leaf and we need to try to become not just good at security, we need to try to become the best at security. We need to become a model and we're going to show what it's like for DeFi to get better, for, you know, for somebody to change and really come and improve themselves. And I think you're going to see that from us. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, well, we know that, as I said before, Ethereum does move fast and break things. We've seen, um, you know, the DAO happen. Synthetics had an issue with their oracles recently. Um, I really do wish you guys all the best uh, fixing all this up. And it's a very uh, exciting and fast-moving space where these things do happen from time to time. So I guess the thing I'm most glad about is that no one's lost money. You guys are looking to um, take that hit if anyone does as well. So any final thoughts for people at home, Carl? Yeah, um, you know, thanks for tuning in. Um, you know, we, we really love the community. We love your support. Thank you for being with us. Um, everybody who's reached out, um, you know, so yeah, that's all I want to say. I just want to say thank you, everyone. Awesome. I know you've been working really hard, so I'll let you get back to it. So thanks for tuning in, guys, and uh, thanks for your time, Carl. Thanks, Alex. Cheers.